Today, over a billion men and women identify themselves as Buddhists. From its beginnings in India 2,500 years ago, the message of the Buddha was initially only transmitted by a few wandering monks. Three centuries later, in Bactria, it would undergo a profound metamorphosis through its contact with Greek culture. What was the spiritual, artistic and cultural alchemy that gave birth to such an immensely popular religion? One evening in India, in the 6th century BC, Sakyamuni, literally a sage from the Sakya tribe, was meditating under a tree. He suddenly understood the origin of all things and became the Buddha, which means the enlightened one. A pragmatic philosophy rather than a religion, his message teaches how to liberate oneself from all needs in order to attain an enlightened state. After the death of the Blessed One, his disciples spread his teachings throughout India, from Ceylon to the Himalayas. At the same time, in Greece, Pythagoras was teaching that renunciation and rigor were required to reach knowledge. These monks are still practicing primitive Buddhism and live their daily life according to the precepts established by Sakyamuni. They believe that life in society only causes confusion. They therefore enter into holy orders and lead an austere existence until their death. They only own a single set of clothes and live off charity. Such monks are obeying the words of the Buddha, who stated, the human condition is made up of suffering, and only years of ascetic practices will lead to a path that enables a state of infinite fulfillment to be attained. This state is known as enlightenment and illumination. They live isolated in the mountains and spend most of their time meditating. Meditation enables them to seek the essence of things. Buddha, the Blessed One, was convinced that man searches for idols. Therefore, he expressly forbade any representation of his person. Thus, primary importance was placed on the spiritual message alone to oppose man's natural inclination towards idolatry. After the death of the Buddha, his disciples spread his teachings throughout Hindu India and Ceylon, the present-day Sri Lanka. 
Ajanta, to the northeast of Bombay, is the location of one of the oldest Buddhist sites. This immense monument, half a kilometer in diameter, was dug into the rock in the shape of a half circle. Each new monk dug his own sanctuary. Therefore, the temple was a building site for over a thousand years. In the oldest cave, the sculptures and frescoes date back to 200 BC. The restoration work is meticulous. Each image is cleaned with a solvent, centimeter by centimeter, and Buddhist symbols gradually reappear. In this, the oldest known fresco, the believers are praying in front of Kala Chakra, the Wheel of Law, an ancient Indian symbol, and not in front of an image of the Buddha. We see the Kala Chakra, and people are, you can see here, people with the folded hands here, with the people with the folded hands here, even on this side, people with the folded hands, people with the folded hands, they are worshipping the Kala Chakra, which is the sign of Lord Buddha. The Indian artisans told the story of the Buddha without ever representing him, other than in the form of a lotus, a horse without a rider, or a tree. This was a way of honoring the instructions of the Buddha Sakyamuni to never represent his image. This would only be respected until the second century BC. Neighboring caves, many depictions of the Buddha were found sculptured into the rocky wall. They were made 300 years after the Kalachakra frescoes, which was the length of time it took before prohibition was no longer respected. It was nothing less than a revolution. After the death of Sakyamuni, eight of his disciples collected the ashes of their master and distributed them in eight different locations throughout India, which became sanctuaries or the stupas. During the next two centuries, these wandering monks, living on charity, would spread Buddhism throughout the north of the Indian subcontinent. Another century passed before Buddhism reached the province of Gandhara in Bactria, a region located between the present-day Afghanistan and Pakistan. For almost a century, the descendants of the soldiers Alexander left behind during his conquests had colonized the kingdom. The Buddhists set about founding hundreds of monasteries throughout the kingdom. In addition to the descendants of Alexander's soldiers, the local populations that Buddhist missionaries discovered also included Greek settlers coming from Greece, Egypt and Antioch. In other words, a world deeply marked by Greek culture. This was the first meeting between Buddhism and Greek thinking, and it would be a fundamental one. A flourishing type of art started in this region. It owed its existence to the artists and artisans originating from the Mediterranean, who adapted their skills to local tastes. It is revealed in the architecture, the statues and paintings, and is called Greco-Bactrian art. Bactria, the Greek colony furthest away from the Mediterranean, was governed by kings and a local aristocracy. 
In common with Alexander the Great, the Greco-Bactrian kings were characterized by their open-mindedness and their respect for the beliefs of other populations. The most well-known sovereign was Menander, who ruled Bactria in the second century BC. When the Buddhist monks arrived in Bactria, Menander decided to question one of them, called Nagasena, an old Buddhist sage. How do the teachings of Buddha resolve the problem of suffering? How can you attain enlightenment and overcome death? Over 300 of these exchanges between the two men on the meaning of life and death were compiled, enabling the sage to express the spiritual message of Buddhism. These dialogues were translated into Chinese and for several centuries would serve as fundamental texts for teaching Buddhism. This face-to-face -face encounter constitutes the first meeting between Buddhism and Greek philosophy. The Norwegian Academy of Science and Literature It is here that the sutras are kept, which were discovered a few years ago in the Bamiyan Caves at the westernmost point of Gandhara. Sutras are philosophical texts on the life and teachings of Buddha and his disciples. They are used for prayer and Buddhist teaching. Several thousands of fragments of texts written on palm leaves and birch bark have been found in the Gandhara Valley. They're written in Karostahi, an Indian language. The oldest ones date back to the second century AD. Scientists from all over the world have gathered to study these manuscripts. They're so fragile that they cannot be handled. This is the reason why researchers have used digital images to reconstruct the fragments to decipher them. Professor Richard Salomon, a Karostahi specialist, carried out the translation. He discovered two extremely specific words in one of the texts. That is number 116 here. Yeah, yeah. That's here, and it says paramida sho. Paramida is perfection, and sho is uh, number six. The six virtues are giving, including one's life, living according to morality, patience and humility, energy and tenacity, meditation, and an intuitive understanding of oneself and the universe. The first four virtues existed from the very start of Buddhism. The fifth and sixth virtues appeared afterwards and lead to self-fulfillment and enlightenment. They transcend the discipline and ascetic formalism in vogue during this period. It is possible to meditate and attain enlightenment anywhere and at any time without being a monk. This is the basis of Mahayana Buddhism, called the large vehicle, which is based on inner experiences. This new practice would transform Buddhism. In the 6th century in China, it would give birth to Zen Buddhism, 
which then spread to Korea and Japan. As Buddhism became popular under the effect of this new practice, a new requirement emerged. It is expressed in this sutra, I want to see Buddha, I want to hear the voice of Buddha. This requirement would find a response in Gandhara, a valley of the Bactrian kingdom. Bactria, a kingdom founded by the successors of Alexander the Great. Hada, east of Kabul, was located in present-day Afghanistan. Ten Buddhist temples were built on this site. Hada suddenly became famous when no less than 15,000 Buddhist sculptures were exhumed revealing that Gandhara was the holy land of Buddhism. Unfortunately, the sculptures can now only be seen in photos, as most of them, in common with the giant Buddhas at Bamiyan, have been destroyed, the victims of the religious vandalism of the Taliban. These statues were the first representations of the Buddha and date from around 100 BC. They embodied the Greco-Buddhist school, which appeared in the region where Hellenism was solidly entrenched. The innovation consisted in daring to physically represent the Buddha, which the Indian tradition had only evoked through symbols. Professor Tazi was responsible for discovering this sculptured piece, composed of a Buddhist character enthroned amidst Greek gods and heroes. What immediately attracts the attention is the way the statue of Buddha has been represented. His tunic is Greek, with typically Ionian pleats. This sculpture, representing a goddess offering fruit, is a typical subject of Hellenistic sculptures. She is next to an athletic character reminiscent of Hercules, a Greek demigod. On another sculptured piece, Professor Tazi noted a male face. The purity and sureness of the features, and the similarity to the profile in other depictions of Alexander, suggest that this could indeed be the famous conqueror. The encounter between a Hellenized Buddha and the characters of the Greek pantheon marks the birth of a new kind of art. Greco-Buddhist art. Professor Bernard carried out excavations at the al Kanum site, to the north of Hadda. Là, vous avez un art dont le contenu est bouddhique, euh, à la fois dans sa théologie, dans les épisodes de la vie du Bouddha, qui ne ressemble à rien d'autre. La vie du Bouddha, elle se passe dans un milieu purement indien, dans des traditions indiennes. Il est entouré de brahmanes. Ça n'a rien à voir avec la philosophie grecque. Euh, mais n'empêche qu'on constate que, euh, pour illustrer les vies du Bouddha, euh, les artistes de cette région à partir du, de notre ère à peu près, euh, ont emprunté des formes hellénisées. Le type lui-même du Bouddha, on a dit, ce, ce plissé typique de, du manteau du Bouddha, de, de son manteau de, de moine, euh, s'inspirait de, de modèles grecs. Mais euh, il est évident que l'art gréco-bouddhique résulte de la fusion d'une pensée indienne, dans une certaine mesure aussi, de tradition iconographique indienne, mais dans une très très large mesure, surtout euh, d'une euh, tradition artistique grecque d'Asie centrale.
In fact, the historic meeting between Buddhism and Hellenism responded to a demand from the newly converted population to see their gods represented. Therefore, for the first time, the Buddha appeared with the features of a young Apollo. From 145 BC, the Greeks were progressively chased from their Bactrian land by nomadic Indo-Scythian tribes, the Kushans. The violence of the invasion and the brutality of these horsemen from the steppes did not alter the nature of Greco-Buddhist art. It would evolve under the Kushan Empire, as demonstrated by the ruins of the Buddhist temples found in Gandhara, near Hadda, Bamiyan, and at the Ranagat site. The increasing number of followers led to the construction of a large number of Buddhist temples and monasteries. On this site, 1900 years ago, the largest temple in the region was built. It was over 15 meters high. A large collection of Buddhist statues was found, including this statue, with a purity and softness typical of Apollo, even though it dates from the Kushan era. Japanese archaeologists searched for key stages denoting the evolution of Buddhism in Gandhara up to the time it arrived in Japan. 1.16 and point, you can leave that. 160.5 and 160.5, okay? In addition to Greco-Buddhist statues, they also discovered a sculpture from the 2nd or 3rd century AD. はい、こう東神大の彫刻ですね。これをね、見ますとこうちょっと腰にこうベルトがあったりね、ハートがあの垂れ飾りがあったりですね。彫刻のこの絵柄から見ましてもね、やはりそのクシャンの偉い人、あ
which so many people had fought for, and finally conquered northern India. The Kushan Empire was thus established and would last for four centuries. It imposed peace on Central Asia that was used to permanent wars. In the first century AD, the Han Chinese only recognized the existence of three empires, its own, Rome, then at its apogee, and the Kushan Empire that occupied a central position on the Silk Road linking the Mediterranean to China. With no civilization of its own, the Kushans adopted the ways of the sedentary population in Bactria. Over time, they invaded the structures of their conquered kingdoms, occupying their cities, adopting their habits and customs, and abandoning their tent-dwelling life. In a word, they totally changed their lifestyle, except their traditional clothing, which was preserved. King Kanishka was dressed in clothing typical of Central Asia, a long coat and leather boots. He bore the titles of Great King, borrowed from the sovereigns of India. King of Kings, in common with the kings of Persia. And Son of Heaven, from the Chinese emperors. All these titles were engraved on his statue, revealing the close links of the Kushan Empire with these countries. When they arrived in Bactria, the Kushans discovered Zoroastrianism, together with Buddhism. Zoroastrianism was a religion founded around the 9th century BC by Zarathustra. This prophet of Bactria was the first monotheist. He preached the existence of a unique and kind god, Ahura Mazda. Zarathustra preached love for all living beings and purity of thoughts and actions. He prohibited animal sacrifices and contributed to the nomads from the steppes adopting a sedentary lifestyle and developing agriculture. They venerated fire, symbolizing purity. This walk around the fire during a wedding ceremony perpetuates the Zoroastrian tradition. Bu mano mana endi yoshlikka qanchalik biz qilgan gunohlarimizni xudo kechirsin degan maqsadga men yonib kelsin gunohlarimiz endi biz gunohdan forig' bo'lib endi uyli joyli bo'ldik degan ma'no uni bildiradi bu alohida aynalish The coexistence of Zoroastrianism and Buddhism with Greek thinking led to a natural syncretism in the daily life of the various populations that made up the empire. The flames rising up from the Buddha's shoulders remind that the Kushans conferred upon Buddhism elements borrowed from Zoroastrianism. On this coin, with an effigy of King Kanishka, the flames on his shoulder evoke an intermingling between the dynastic cult and the cult of fire. La représentation du Bouddha en majesté comme ça est, 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 est important parce que les souverains couchants eux-mêmes ont les flammes sur leurs épaules. Kanishka s'est présenté comme, comme une divinité où Bouddha est représenté à la manière de présentation royale. Voilà. C'est... Y a, y a, y a, y a, Il y a une complicité entre l'art monastique et l'art de pouvoir. The historian Edouard Rutvalazzi confirmed that Kushan sovereigns used Buddhism to extend their influence. Kanishka, 
взял буддизм на, как сказать, на укрепление своего государственного строя. И одна из причин того, что его покровительство в конечке этого буддизма и проникновение суда его, это то, что в это время буддизм начинает очень активно проводить так называемую миссионерскую деятельность. The Kushans owed their prosperity to the development of commercial links with the Roman Empire. They controlled the Silk Road from the Indus to Peshawar, their capital. From Peshawar, caravans provided a link through the Dernshan Mountains to the Chinese outposts before reaching the distant Xi'an, the capital of the Middle Kingdom. This vault at the Lahore Museum protects coins. An examination sheds light on the political approach taken by the Kanishka sovereigns. Coins were minted in their effigy and were remodeled from golden Roman coins and preserved the original weight. By circulating these coins, they controlled the commercial exchanges with the Mediterranean. दूसरी वजह यह थी कि कनिष्का बहुत ज्यादा लिबरल हुक्मरान था मजहबी तंग नजरी का शिकार नहीं था यही वजह है कि वो जहां जहां भी गया है उसने वहां के गॉड गॉडेस को अपने सिक्कों में अपने अंदाज से डिपिक्ट किया है उसने ये मजहबी तंग नजरी का सबूत नहीं दिया वो जहां जहां भी गया उनके मजहबी ख्याल को अपनाया यही वजह है कि उसको फतवाद करने में बहुत आसानी हुई और उसकी सल्तनत दिन ब दिन वसी होती गई The political intelligence of the Kanishka kings is also demonstrated by these coins. The reverse reveals each of the numerous gods venerated by the many people of the Kushan Empire. Shiva, venerated by Hindus. Mitra, the sun god of the Iranian people. and Anamos, the Greek god of wind and air. During the four centuries of peace imposed by the Kushan Empire, Buddhism underwent an expansion that would turn it into one of the leading world religions. Dalvazen Tepe, formerly known as Tamez, was one of the main towns in Bactria on the northern bank of the Amu Daya, at the border of Uzbekistan and Afghanistan. In ancient times, it was the main crossing point on the Oxus between Bactria and Samarkand. In its ruins, Russian archaeologists discovered large quantities of jewels in the Kushan houses and tombs. The gold ingots, bracelets and necklaces with which the Kushan were buried. Uzbek archaeologist Bahadir Turganov paid special attention to the coins found in the tombs.
Their presence can be explained by the Greek custom of placing a coin in the mouth of the deceased. This tradition may explain the attitude of Kushans towards death. They thought that if the coin is in the mouth of the deceased, it will be protected by the second world's life. И вот имея монеты и золото, драгоценности и другие предметы быта, которые его сопровождают в могиле, вот это ему дает такое, значит, хорошее, ему обеспечивает на том, том, на, на том свете хорошую жизнь. A Buddhist sutra, translated into Chinese, quoted a Kushan converted to Buddhism. There is no meaning in taking treasures to live after death. And further, to release oneself from death, it is better to practice the six virtues during one's life. The fear of death led the Kushan believers to make donations. Many depictions of these donors have been found near the sanctuaries in Gandhara. Alors, euh, à Ada, d'une façon générale, on découvre beaucoup de stupas qui sont ornés d'images. À chaque panneau, il y a deux, trois ou quatre personnes. Ce sont des donateurs couchants. Un exemple, vous voyez euh, de part et d'autre d'un Bouddha. On voit un couple. Le monsieur, les mains jointes, tient dans la main des pétales peut-être de, de fleurs. La femme ou la sœur de ce monsieur qui, elle, tient à, apporte l'argent. Ça veut dire que la femme, dans les représentations... Kushan dans, dans, dans les monastères apporte plus de présents que les, les, les messieurs. Ici, une autre famille ou le reste de la même famille avec euh, un, une jeune fille et un petit euh, prince Kushan. Ici, un moine et là, un autre couple. Obtaining happiness after death was a constant source of concern for the Kushans. This is what is written in a text on a parchment found recently in Gandhara. We wish for the happiness of our father, our mother, and all the members of our family, in this life as well as the afterlife. Although Buddhism does not demand any donations, the Kushans believed that their happiness after death depended upon such offerings. In this, they remained true to their ancestral traditions. Next to the ruined stupas of Ranagat, the archaeologists discovered notched stone blocks, whose purpose was to receive the donated coins. The stupas are reminiscent of the eight sanctuaries erected to house the ashes of the Buddha Sakyamuni. Other unexpected elements were revealed during the excavations of the Ranagat temple. The archaeologists were surprised by its strange structure. It seemed to be constructed around an imposing central stupa. However, other smaller stupas were found surrounding it. Forty such stupas were found, a surprising number for a single site.
、ここはですね、ご覧になってわかりますように、いくつもスーパーありますが、もともと立ってたところの間にですね、無理やり床を作って、まだこう、スーパーを作っていると。だから本当にそのスーパーを作るこうエネルギーといいますか、すごいと思うんですけどね。Virtual imaging has made it possible to reconstruct the various stages of building this monument. To start with, a stupa was built in the center of the site. Around its circumference, other stupas of different sizes were built. Lastly, a final and gigantic stupa, 15 meters high, covered the central stupa. This was how the Ranagat temple obtained its considerable dimensions. Bactria owes its temples, stupas, and statues to the fervor of the Buddhist believers. However, not only was Buddhism the first major religion based on prayer in the history of humanity, it was also the cultural link underpinning the greatness and unity of the Kushan Empire. Peshawar in Pakistan, the heart of Gandhara. Kanishka administered his empire from this city, in which he had established his winter residence. It was from here that the Silk Roads left for China. Legend still has it that the king built the largest stupa in the world on a small hill above the city. A reliquary destined to receive ashes has been recently exhumed. A representation of the Buddha with a depiction of Kanishka below was found on its cover. This reliquary illustrates the close links that existed for four centuries between Buddhism and the Kushans until the Huns overran the empire. In 425 AD. Buddhism continued to expand beyond the barrier of the Dunshan Mountains to reach China and Japan. From the first century AD, Buddhist monks started to travel to China using trade caravans, the only way of traveling more safely in such dangerous regions. The tales from Chinese travelers are full of comments about the violence of the Western marches in the Middle Kingdom. The Huns wreaked havoc on their travels throughout the region. Total insecurity reigned. To combat the Huns, the Han emperors mounted several military expeditions and built small forts all along the 500 kilometers bordering the Danshan Mountains. From the second century AD, the massive arrival of Buddhist monks in the Middle Kingdom ensured that Buddhism became the third great philosophy in China, alongside Confucianism and Taoism. Each of these three ways of thinking would change through its contact with the two others. The Karakarum Highway, the old caravan route, 
has always been the crossing point between the Punjab and China. With steep passes rising up to 4,000 meters, caravans from the Indus Valley would constantly travel along it. Rock paintings are found all along this road. They depict stupas and Buddhist images. They show that monks, pilgrims and artisans have passed there and reveal the spreading of Buddhism to China. Later, by sea, Buddhism would reach Japan. Nara Festival in Japan. At the Todaiji Temple, the arrival of spring is being celebrated. Sacred fires are lit to burn away impurities and abolish passion, undoubtedly revealing that the encounter between Zoroastrianism and Buddhism lives on. This is the result of a spiritual and cultural intermingling unique in the history of humanity. Buddhism started in India before metamorphosing 2,000 years ago after coming into contact with Greek thinking. It is the most beautiful and singular meeting between the East and the West. <laughs>